Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC Paris card from a DFS perspective. And for those of you that have been following this progress of this card along the week, throughout the week, there's been a lot of, excuse me, there's been a lot of uh, fight switching, fight canceling, fight rebooking, things like that. And in addition to that, because this fight features a lot of Parisians and fighters that people don't know all that well, it does present the opportunity for, I don't know, quite a bit of fragility in the projections, to say the least. But when you have cards like that, I think it's really important to just kind of just go back to basics and just rely on the numbers. You can get all kinds of swayed with all these different pronunciations of the names and the different basharats and the, the bureaus and the Jamoris and this, that, and the other thing. And it's creating a lot of a lot of aggravation among the community as far as analyzing this stuff. So for us, we're just going to go back to basics here and uh, go back to the numbers, presume the lines are somewhat accurate, and come up with some good plays. And I already know what is the right thing to do on this slate. I don't know whether I should just tell you in advance or make you earn it, but this slate is very similar to uh to a slate back in march where i was very clear what you were supposed to do and i executed it and if it wasn't for one fight i would have you know taken the whole the whole cheese down <laughs> to, to turn a phrase um but there are a couple of fights that we need to kind of talk about um but let's just get right to it i mean let's 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 talk about this main event and then we'll kind of piece the rest together so it's important to realize the difference between DFS and wager. Okay? When, when you are playing the betting game, you need, you're, you're presuming that the line is, act, is inaccurate, right? I mean, otherwise you wouldn't be betting. So you're presuming that, that you know more than the line does on a particular fight. And it's, you have to give an opinion on basically how a fight is going to go how a fight is going to proceed, et cetera, et cetera. But in DFS, it's not like that. In DFS, you don't need to worry too much about your opinion on the fight. You need to worry about kind of the range of outcomes. And this main event is a perfect example of that. For better or worse, you have a situation where this fight is going to go one of two ways. It just is. Um, I shouldn't say it just is. It's a high likelihood that it just does. Uh, and that is either Sergey Spivak implements his game plan of getting a bunch of takedowns, probably a finish, or he does not. Okay? And, and the thing is, is that if he does, he is going to score through the roof. He just is. The, 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 the combination of takedowns and finishing upside for a guy like this at 7,500 is just way too high to ignore. And the card I'm referring to, and you're going to just say I'm crazy for making these two slates the same, but was when uh, Marab Dabashvili fought Peter Young. Now, totally different level, obviously, totally different. Um, but the whole idea was that of win condition. Right? And when we go back to that Marab fight, there was a lot of the community that were saying that Marab was not going to be able to get his takedowns that Jan has good takedown defense. He's going to piece him up on the feet. And they made Jan a two-to-one favorite as a result of that. And, and it seemed, seemed reasonable, okay? But that was not relevant, okay? What was relevant is what happens when Marab did win, okay? The idea was that even though Marab was a two-to-one underdog, that means he wins 35-plus percent of the time or 30% of the time. And in those wins, as we discussed, um, he was just going to be the, in the optimal line. And the fact is, is that that's the way it worked out. And he actually did win. He scored a million points or whatever it is. But, but I decided that week that the, the right thing to do is just to basically go all in on it. Because if you plotted all of the results of that fight, even though, you know, 67% of them were going to be wins for Jan, if you plotted like the top scores, 
I would say like 80 percent of them are going to come from Marab's uh, Marab's victories. OK. And this fight is 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 very, very. OK. And you're hearing a lot of debate on whether Spivak's going to get takedowns. You're hearing a lot of debate about whether Gon's, you know, significant advantage on the feet is going to take over. The point is, is that it doesn't matter. OK, because when you look at the money line here, all that's factored into the price. And you have a situation where Cyril Gaon is going to win the fight about 35, excuse me, about 65% of the time. Maybe a little less, right? Maybe about more like 60% of the time, something 60% of the time. The fact is, is that Sergei Spivak is going to win this fight about 37% of the time. And when he wins, he's breaking the slope right, at that price. Just has to. I don't say has to, but it's extremely likely. Whereas when Gon wins, he's optimal a, a decent amount of the time, but not all the time. And when it comes to ownership in this fight, I find it hard to believe. I, I don't, shouldn't say that. I mean, Spivak should be the highest, the higher owned of the two fighters. I don't know if these if that's actually going to be the case though. I, mean, I didn't look at ownership projections quite yet, but I still think that Don is going to be higher owned for some reason. Um, because you have uh, a card with 9K plus fighters who are extremely fishy with, re with respect to the metrics. So you have a situation where Don is a reasonable favorite who's got a lot of finishing upside and, and he's got five rounds. He's going to just show up in so many optimals that I think that he's going to be more popular than Spivak. So where I think that Spivak should be, if you ran this in a computer, you know what I mean? Like, I think he would be in the optimal just a hell of a lot more often than he's going to be on. So let's just put it that way. So I really believe that what you're supposed to do this fight is, is go all in on Spivak. At, at the very least, you should go 67% Spivak and then... Okay, what else do you do with this fight? You could play 67% speed back and then make 33% fade. Or if you want, if you really want to play gone, you can. But if that's the, if that's the case, I would play 67% speed back, maybe 15%, uh, maybe 16% gone. And in those gone lineups, you're really going to need to get funky. You know what I mean? You're going to deal, you're dealing with a play that's not that great. I mean, it's good, but it's, it's going to be also popular. So you're going to have to pair that one with some really low owned fighters. Now, now you could say the same thing about Spivak as well. You know, I mean, of the underdogs, he's clearly going to be the most popular underdog. And I still am going to suggest that he's the most popular fighter on the slate, but if you go all in, that's fine. You know what I mean? That, now you're getting, you're getting to serious, you know, then you're going to leverage on the field anyway. Um, but here's one little trick that I'm going to recommend here to you guys. And again, I haven't even gone over any of these fight yet because I think it's just much more important to deal with the, 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 the context of the slate. And I went about this, I, I talked about this earlier in one of my, my late sessions um, this week when I was talking about baseball, but nonetheless, I want to consider doing this. Build lineups with God. Okay. Whatever your favorites are, you know, make them good low on, you know, GPP or type lineups. And then just swap him out for speedback. So what's that doing? What's that doing? What that is doing is leaving 1,200 on the table at least, right? With your speedback lineups because he's 1,200 less. And what that's going to do for you is it's going to get you some, some pretty good uniqueness. And the reason why it's going to happen is because people that play 150 and people that, you know, that use optimizers, what they're going to do is they're going to put their projections in whatever it is. And the way the algorithm is going to work, it's going to do its thing. And then if it gets to that last fight, it's going to see there's say 8,700 left. And even though Spivak is probably, you know, has a lot of upside, the, the, the algorithms and the optimizers can't help but just put that that last spot in with Gon because Gon does have 
a higher median projection. It just does. So when you're dealing with these optimizers, they're going to be putting in like a whole bunch of gone lineups when there's 1,200 left to be, when there's 8,700 left to be put in. So if you put speed back in instead of that, I think that's a pretty sharp, uh, sharp approach. Okay. Um, all right. So that's the first. Thing. Second thing I want to talk about is this fight between William Gomes and Giannis uh, Gamora. Now, on normal fight slates, this would be just kind of a free square and talked about but like, all the time. Okay. For some reason, well, I'm going to get to it. It's not really taking the same steam as some of these others in the same situation. Because this is what happened. They priced Gomes at minus, uh, excuse me. They priced Gomes at 8,400 when he was supposed to fight somebody else. He's basically a pick or a small favor against somebody else. They priced him 8,400. And then they swapped these fights around and they gave him this other dude. And he is a minus 200 favorite now. So he's being priced at 8,400 where he should be priced probably at about 9K with respect to uh, to win odds here. So this is what I like to call a theoretical lock, all right, is to play Gomez. The only thing that's preventing everybody from piling on him is because Gomez does not exactly have the greatest metrics, okay? Um, so when you look at him, if you were judging him as your normal two-to-one favorite, all right, you, you'd want him to have an inside the distance line of like minus 110 or something like that, or a lot of takedown upside. I mean, you look at his inside the distance prop, it's pretty poor. It's like plus 320. However, he does have some takedown upside as well. So I would not discount Gomez as a very strong play strictly on the money. Line, okay. And, and remember, it's an 11 fight card. So on an 11 fight card, wins are just very important, okay? So if you're getting incredible win equity here against the line and you have a sliver of even takedown upside, I think you have to respect that more than I think the public is going to, okay? All right. So that's the next thing is, is I think Gomez is a very, very strong play. So if we're kind of like building this, right? You play Gomez, Spivak, and we'll build a line. We'll try to build it like with 1,200 left on the table just for fun. And the rest of these fights, we're just going to just go as normal. We're going to go through. We're going to see where the numbers play out and, and come up with kind of good plays and then kind of build a good kind of like lineup along the way. All right, so first fight, we have Jacqueline Calasante, I guess, versus uh, Yara Farm. Uh, Zara Farm, she's an extremely big favorite, minus 350, so... I imagine she's about 9,300 or so, and she is 9,400. So from a GPP perspective, what do you need for her at 9,400? Now, again, it, it, it's only an 11 fight card, so wins are more important than they usually are, but upside is still important, okay? Um, so let's uh, let's take a look. You need to have at least, like I would say, a minus 120 inside the distance, plus some takedown upside. And I can tell you right now, she's just not going to have it. I mean, uh, Pavel Kavich or whatever his name, her name is, she is inside the distance, plus one, maybe, maybe plus 110, something like that. So it's pretty poor, you know. So so I would consider her a very fringy play. Um, and as you'll see, this is, we're building up for, uh, you know, more justification of why something like Cyril Gaon is going to show up as a really good play. You know what I mean? Like you have these $9,400 fighters who just look like terrible with respect to the normal metrics. So, uh, and, and fair and she, her win odds are just not that good. And the fact that Cavalcante is not going to be highly owned means that fair you don't get that much leverage either. You know, so I think, I think neither of these fighters are particularly good, uh, good GPP plays. All right, Fareed Basharad versus Clayton Rodriguez. So we're going to look at the inside the disc. Well, we'll look at the money line first. Big, big favorite, minus almost 400, even with big, minus 330 or so. Um, so we're expecting, again, about 9,200, which is what it is. So for 9,200, what you're going to need, again, is at least minus 110 inside, one, one, minus 110 inside the distance. 
And it would be nice to have have takedown upside as well. Now, in this fight, you have a pretty poor inside the distance line. You have, uh, where is this? Bashrod inside is plus 260, which is really not that much better than Gomi's, if you want to know the truth. He does have takedown upside, though, okay? But the real question is, is how much? You know, he, had, he did have three takedowns against Blackshear, and that, looking back, was a pretty big deal because Blackshear, it turns out, is a pretty good wrestler himself. So, yeah. I think that Bashra does have enough takedown upside to overcome a little bit of an inferior inside the distance line. So I'm going to put him as a good play. We're going to have to wait to see if anybody else shows up as a kind of a better play, but I do think you show up as a good play um, given that takedown upside. So we'll put him in. Uh, let's look at Rodriguez just for the hell of it, because if, if Bashra is in fact going to rate out as a good play, it's going to mean that he's popular. And so you take a, you always have to take a look. Like when one side looks really good, you have to take a look at the other side because if one side's going to look really good, you know what that means? That everybody's going to see it looks good. And you'll be able to get leverage playing the other side. Okay? So you have um, Clayton Rodriguez. You know his, his money line's going to be poor, but let's just take a look at the inside the distance line just for kicks. If you if you could get him at maybe plus 350, like if he's going to have a inside the distance line of maybe plus 350, that might be good enough to take a shot. Let's take a look. Um, Clayton Rodriguez, inside the distance. No, nah, it's not really good enough. It's like plus 500. Uh, so I'm probably just not going to get to him. I really wanted to also because he's going to be pretty pretty popular, I think, uh, with Basra. Um, is this good enough, though? I mean, the, the money line is just terrible, you know? Like, So it's not as if he's a plus 180 and I'll live with the decision that happens going to happen like 40% of the time or 30% of the time. It's just not that good. So you'd have to have some pretty good finishing upside. It doesn't quite look like it. All right, moving on up the card here, we have Noah Cornell versus Cornole, I guess, versus Jocelyn Edwards. It's pretty much a pick em right? Uh, maybe Edwards a little bit of a favorite. So we'll take a look at the odds here. And yeah, it's about right. Edwards is a little bit of a favorite on the money line as well. So with these fights, you, you need to have an inside the distance line of a, probably a plus 250 to be, to you know, listen, if it was under 200, great, but at least a plus 250 be viable. Um, plus or, or some takedown upside. When you look at the inside the distance line, it's actually very interesting because you have uh, Edwards inside the distance, like plus 500, just totally unplayable. You know, no, no takedown upside, whatever. But this Quinoa inside the distance line at plus 200, that's pretty, that's pretty aggressive, you know? Um, so I have to say that as, as tough as this is to play her, I mean, you, you got to respect the metrics here and, and, and put her in. So I, I actually like this as far as the numbers go. And you're going to hear, you know, Edwards never gets finished. He's very technical. Corn, Cornole has not faced anybody. I don't know. I mean, the numbers kind of are what they are. So um, I think it's a pretty, uh, pretty decent play here. All right, moving on. We have uh, – boy, this is going to be long, isn't it? I will see it. Um, we have Ange Lusa versus Reese McKee. You have Lusa as like a minus 160 and Reese McKee plus 130. So we're expecting maybe like an 8,600, 8,700 or so price. Let's see here. A um, little, a little dicey. I mean, 8,800 is a little, a little pricey for that money line. I guess McKee might have a little bit of line value. Maybe. Let's take another look at this. Um, I mean, I guess. I mean, I guess. Um, now, at these prices, right, for for loose uh, for Angelusa, you need to have an inside the distance line of not that much. I mean, maybe plus one forty, something like that, plus one thirty, or takedown upside. And on the other side, you don't need much out of uh, McKee at his price, maybe like plus three hundred or something like that. Let's take a look. Angelus inside the distance. Is going to be plus 200. 
or so. I mean, eh, it's okay. Uh, McKee inside the distance, plus 400. Eh, it's okay. Not really. And this is kind of, I don't know, this is this is flying in the face of my of my eye test because when I, when I saw these, when I saw both the tape on both these guys, they both seem to kind of bring the heat and they don't seem to protect themselves that well. So it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of be a tough, uh, it's going to be a tough, uh, tough fade if you want to know the truth. But according to the numbers, it's just really kind of an average, average fight to target. Now, the only thing I will say is that, um, I mean, loose is being priced as, as being able to get some, uh, some takedowns here, but, but I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say that this fight is just kind of like borderline. Now, again, if you're, if you are going to follow my advice and lock in something like Spivak, then you're going to have to play these guys. Um, but if you're playing one lineup or so, maybe, maybe this could be one to fade. I, I don't know. This is, this is, I'm actually a little torn on this. All right, uh, Taylor Lapalus versus Kalin uh, Lofgren. So here's another one that had money line issues. So Lofgren, if you look at his price, I mean, he's 9,300. And the reason why is he was originally fighting somebody against whom he was a huge favorite. So they reshuffled everything. And now he's he's a two to one underdog. So he's basically on play, right? Um, I mean, he does probably have some finishing upside, but certainly not enough to justify a $9,300 price tag. I mean, his, even though he's pretty aggressive, he's going to win a lot of his fights inside a distance, still only like plus 300. So it's a, uh, it's pretty poor. Um, so he can't be played. And let's look at Lapalus. He's minus 150. And he's actually being priced pretty much where he's supposed to be. And I'm pretty sure that he doesn't have that great of, of a metric here. Yeah. Him inside the distance also plus 350. I mean, he's less likely to finish than Lockwood, if you want to know the truth. So I think this fight's pretty much a pass. All right. Uh, Morgan Charrier versus Manolo Zacchini. So this is a fight that that looks better on the numbers than in the analysis. Um, and I think that these fights are usually pretty good uh, when you're dealing with, uh, with GPPs. Because you have... Like Morgan Sherry there, he's known as having like low volume. But when you look at the numbers here, first of all, he's a minus three to one favorite. His his price is pretty reasonable for a three to one favorite. And again, a 9,100, all you really need is an inside distance prop of my, minus 110, which we really haven't even seen yet of anybody. And if you look at it, if I'm not mistaken, he's, he's let's see. Yeah, I mean, inside the distance, minus 115 or so. So perfectly, perfectly good, you know. And, and for whatever reason, I don't think he's getting the same type of popularity, even as Basharat. I think I think somehow Basharat is going to be higher owned. I, I, I wouldn't imagine why. I mean, I, could ima I can imagine why. I mean, he's got a little bit of a better name. We've bet on him before, you know. But – these numbers are what they are. And if Shari does have that type of inside the distance, bro, he he could have some takedown upside also. So I think that he's uh I actually think he's significantly better than Basharat. I, I think. I don't know, but he's definitely better as far as I'm concerned. Uh, for a GPP player. Um Zucchini, I mean, he's take a look at it, but you know, he doesn't win the fight too often. He probably does have a good inside the distance prop given his price, though. Not, not even. Oh my god, this is terrible. At plus eight hundred. So, uh, yeah. So Cherry are pretty good play, and we're kind of building this thing pretty easily. Moving on, we have we already talked about Gomis against uh, Gomieri. We have Volkan Uzdemir versus Bogdan Guskov. And, and here is another one. This is another fight where the analysis is a little less appealing than the numbers. I mean, Ozdemir is kind of on the decline. People are kind of like fading him. And this Guskov guy apparently like brings the heat. Um, but when you look at this, you have 
Ozdemir at minus 180 or something like that, minus 160. So he should be about, well, what was this other guy with the same price? So who was the other minus 180? Lusa or so? Lusa, Lapalus, all these guys. They should be all be about 8,600, I guess. And Ozdemir is 8,600. But at 8,600, remember what you need. I mean, you need to have an inside the distance line about plus 140 or 150 or so. I mean, you look at it, I mean, he's, where is this? He's inside the distance. He's like minus 105. I mean, this is what you want from like a 9K, 9,100-hour fighter. So, I mean, I don't know. It looks good to me. Um, let's look at the other side of this. Because if it's going to look good to me, it's probably going to look good to other people, I suppose. So let's take a look at the at the, the Buskov side. Hang on. Uh, Buskov side. This inside the distance line of plus 200 is pretty, uh, I got to tell you, that's pretty reasonable. So I would actually play both sides of this. Right, this is a, this is actually a good underdog. Yeah, when you got a guy who's plus 200 inside the distance, who's only, what's his price? 7,600. This is a very good underdog. So both of these, both sides of this fight, I think are extremely strong. Okay, so moving on, we have uh, Benoit saint versus Thiago Moises. Pretty well, the last next three are pretty well debated. So forget about debating who's actually going to win. Let's just look at the numbers here. So saint uh at minus 150, maybe minus 140 or so, should be about 8,400 or so. And he's 8,500, reasonable. So at 8,500, again, you don't need that much. You've got a couple of 8,500-hour guys we've talked about. He needs to have an inside the distance line of maybe about 140, maybe 150, or takedown upside. Now, when you look at the inside the distance line, you have Santini inside the distance is like plus 130, which is extremely strong, not to mention the fact that he's got takedown upside. So this is a, this is kind of an elite play when it comes to GPPs. Um you just compare him to the other guys in this price range. I mean, him and Ozdemir are both really, really strong plays. And, and you can argue that Santini is better because of his take on ups. Um, on the other side, Moises, the only thing I would say is that, well, let me, let's first look at him. His inside the distance line is very poor, but he does carry with him some leverage because again, if Santini is popular because of listen, all the things I just mentioned, making him a good play, then I do think that Moises can carry some leverage. So I'll play him a little bit, but Santini is clearly the side. Um, so forgive me for misanalyzing what was going to happen with this Firo Nami Yunus fight. I was under the impression when these salaries came out and when this thing came out. I was under the impression that Rose Nami Yunus was going to be the highest owned underdog on the slate, with the exception of maybe of, of Spivak. I just couldn't imagine everybody not playing her. Because everybody always, I mean, that she's like, everybody loves her, I thought. But I guess because she laid an egg her last fight, people are off her now. I mean, she just she beat Zaymi Lang like twice in a row. How is everybody not playing her? Um, but nonetheless, I mean, you're, they're just not. I don't know what to say. Um, unfortunately. Uh, the, the 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 metrics are not that good here. So anyway, you got Fioro minus 180 or so. So she should be about what she is, right? About 8,900, maybe a little less, but whatever. And when it comes to the metrics, at 8,900, she better finish, you know, minus one, th you know, plus 110 or 120. And I don't think you're going to see that. Um, yeah, Fioro inside the distance is hopeless. So she's not playable unless she's going to go for takedowns. I guess that's possible. Maybe she's fringy, but but if again, like if I knew that Rose was going to be really popular, I would say, okay, take a shot at Fiero, but I'm not even seeing that kind of ownership. So I don't know. Nama Yunus inside the distance, not good. Her takedown upside is not, I mean, it's fine, but I, I guess I guess the fight's a pass. It's like a little annoying, but I guess the fight's a pass. Another fight, listen, it's two, two weeks in a row where 
you have a pretty cool female matchup that's just not the greatest from a, G, a GPP perspective. Now, again, depends on your construction. If you're playing 11 fights and you're you're locking in the speed back, you want to get these combinations. So, yeah, you got to play both sides of this probably. But um, but if you're just you know prioritizing a couple of you know a couple of lineups, I, I can't imagine this fight getting in there. And we already talked about uh, Gone versus Speedback. So again, this is this is listen. You have to look and check the ownership projections. They'll be up probably later today. But I think Speedback's an elite play. I think that Santini is an elite play. I think Gomez is a strong play. I think both sides of Ozdemir Guskov are really good. And I mean, if you want something off, you want something a little different. You know, Nora Cornole, I think is, I think that could be good too. So, uh, listen, it's eleven fights. It's going to be tough to get different enough to win, like take the whole thing down. But uh, who knows? Uh, all right, I hope that helps you out. Uh, good luck, everybody.